Let's turn in our Bibles to Romans chapter 5 this morning. Romans chapter 5. And at least part of this is going to be rather familiar, but there is a part of it that's a little bit difficult to read, to be honest with you. Uh, some challenges in, in kind of sorting out. I think we can get the basic idea of what Paul meant, but his wording is a little bit different than we might normally talk. But I'd like to begin our reading with verse number 12. Romans chapter 5 and verse number 12. And we're going to read down. I actually kind of skipped through a little bit. We're going to end up at the end of the chapter. But uh, let's begin with verse number 12. Whereas by, wherefore, as by one man, sin entered into the world, and death by sin. And so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed where there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him that was to come. But not as the offense, so also is the free gift. That's where it kind of gets a little bit wordy, uh, and there's other parts like that. But it's sort of like saying in, uh, you might say, like a reverse connection. Um, it's it's not, not the same, but it, it bears resemblance too. So hopefully you'll understand what I'm saying here. Again, not as the offense, so also is the free gift. For if through the offense of one many be dead... Much more the grace of God and the gift of grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, hath abounded unto many. So what it's saying there is by one man's, by one man's sin, everybody has been condemned to die. But now through one man's righteousness and his sacrifice for us, then all can live. So it's like the, the reverse of that. And so then we jump down to verse number 19. And it says, for as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound, that as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. And so there's a couple ways that we could look at this passage this morning, and one would be sort of, you might just uh, refer to it as one man, uh, or by one man, something like that. But I think we're going to focus, uh, we'll, we'll mention that a little bit, but maybe we'll just focus just a little bit here uh, as far as to kind of have a theme. It'll be that abounding grace that we find in verse number 20, where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. And uh, so I want to just kind of focus on that a little bit here this morning. Maybe we could just pause for a moment before we get into this. This is such a, an important topic, and let's just take a moment for prayer together. Dear Lord, we do thank you this morning for your faithfulness. We thank you that grace is greater than our sin, and would you stir our hearts this morning and apply this truth to us in a very special way. In Jesus' name, amen. Those of you that are familiar with our, our nation's history uh, may remember or may, may be able to kind of associate some events or a, a particular event with uh, the year of 1865. Now, there may be some other things that you would like to call to attention, but one that we may readily think of is, of course, between the years of 1861 and 1865 being um, the war between the states, or we often call it the Civil War. And uh, obviously, a part of that was the tensions over race and everything. And uh, obviously, there was more to it. There's states' rights and all the rest. But, but uh, we often associate some of those things with the relationships between the, the black and the white individuals. And so, uh, particularly slave issues, uh, more so maybe even than the color, although they're, they're closely related in that time frame. So when we think about the year 1865, uh, we associate that with the end of the Civil War, and, and it's, it's kind of time for us to have uh, amends and, and uh, kind of reconciliation, all those things, although that took a while. One Sunday morning that very year, there was a uh, gathering in a, a church uh, down in the South, um, kind of you might say the heart of the South at, of those days, Richmond, Virginia. And there was a fashionable church there. They were meeting that particular day. And um, I'm not sure if they always did this or not, but that particular day, at least, they were going to have communion together at the altar. And when communion was served that day, 
There was a black man that was sitting back in the congregation, and he made his way down the aisle, knelt at the altar, preparing for communion. Again, now put yourself in those days and all the race relations that was going on. And so as he knelt there, there was sort of a rustle of resentment that kind of stirred through the crowd. You know, these are, these are tough times. And now this man wants to come down here right along with all the rest of us and take communion. And there was a further problem because, you know, we're used to little individual cups. And so everybody has their own, and maybe it'd be a little easier that way. But this, this particular church used a shared cup. And so now we're going to have to share the communion cup in Southland, Richmond, Virginia. We're going to have to share this communion cup with, you know, one we've been fighting over. And it was tough. And in the midst of all of that rustle and resentment and question and maybe even rude glances, there was a distinguished man that stood up from his seat, a layman, and he stepped forward to the altar and knelt right beside the black man. And when the rest of the congregation recognized that Robert E. Lee could kneel beside this man after right at the heels of the Civil War. It seemed like their petty grievances were not quite so big, and they were able to gather around as well. One man, one man made such a huge difference. In this chapter, we find the impact of one man as well. And we start off in this, in this reading, um, it's saying in verse number 12, as by one man... Sin entered the world. So let's just pause there for a moment. I think we know the story, but we, we know how God had made Adam and Eve. He'd placed them in the garden. They were, they were given the, pretty much the free reign of the garden. They have the responsibility to care for it, and, and they are to, to uh, make sure that, that things are taken care of. And, of course, Adam named the animals. and You have all, all the different things that were happening there, and yet God had said there's one thing that you can't do, and that is you cannot eat of that tree, the knowledge of good and evil. Well, many times we might look back and think, oh, Adam and Eve, why, why did you have to, to do that with just one request, one, one command? Why would you have had to, to destroy all the rest of us? You know, that's about the way we may feel sometimes. Why did you have to inject sin into our lives? For since Adam sinned, we're all born in sin. I'm not meaning that that uh, somehow our mother sinned in our, in our birth or even conception, but I'm saying that we are born with a fallen nature. And you don't have to teach a child to sin. They don't need any training that way, but they have a nature that is selfish and wants to do its own thing. And because of one man, sin passed on to us. We have a nature of sin. And then as that nature kind of brings forth seeds and, and that seed bring, brings forth fruit, we commit acts of sin. Those are the actions of sin that go even further than the nature of sin. Yes, we need cleansing from the nature. God has, has remedy for that. But because of that nature, we have all sinned and come short of the glory of God. And so we are, we are guilty. We face judgment. So we recognize that. We understand. We, we see that we are sinners. <clears throat> I know some may feel like, like you're just too good to be lost. You know, too good to really be called a sinner. I mean, that sounds pretty harsh. But the issue is every single one of us is a sinner. We are sinful in nature unless God has cleansed that out. And we have committed acts of sin. And so one man, one man caused it where Adam and Eve took of the forbidden fruit. I don't think there was anything especially wrong with the fruit itself, but it was simply that God said no. And really, it doesn't matter what sin you choose. If you say, I'm going to do what I want instead of what God said, then it's the same tree in our life. Oh, it's called by something different, but it's the same thing. By one sin, 
It's been passed down until not one of us can really, truly, not one of us can point our finger at Adam and say, why did you do that? Because we've done that. We have sinned. It came to us by one man, but it is the nature in our lives. But thankfully, Paul goes on and he makes the contrast there. It's not just that Adam sinned and so now you are born a sinner. But then he goes on and he says, there is also another man. One man who has given his life for us. Verse number 19, as by one man's disobedience, that'd be Adam, many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one, that's Jesus Christ himself, by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. And so also by one man, there's a huge impact because we don't have to carry that burden throughout our whole lives, but we can be delivered because Jesus took our place. By one man, we were made sinners. And by one man, we can be made righteous. The choice is up to us. We're the ones who make the the change in our own hearts and lives. Well, we don't make the change. God makes it, but we have to, to change our heart and mind and be prepared to do what God wants us to do. Paul shows this contrast between Adam and Christ. And we are given grace that delivers us from sin. Probably one of the most misused doctrines in the Bible uh, of these days, I would say anyway, probably applies to this issue of grace. Now, there may be some that, that uh, nearly abandon it because they feel like, well, I've got my rules I've got to, to follow. And if I do everything just right, then I'll get to heaven. If I can somehow, uh, you know, earn my way there almost, you know, I'm too good to be lost and all those things. So some may discount grace in the sense that, that I work my way to heaven. There may be others, though, as well, and they abuse it through their carelessness. And they feel like, well, it's all about grace, and so it doesn't matter what I do. It doesn't matter how I live. I will make it through to heaven because of grace. It's a free ticket. I don't have to do anything. I, I can live any way I want to. And so there's abuse. And so, so often there is, is a, a challenge here between true grace and abused grace, whether it's in either, either one of these areas, whether it's that I don't really need grace or that I can just do whatever I want to because of grace. Both of those are a problem. But this chapter here clear, clearly displays the importance of grace for salvation. We must have grace. You might think of it several ways. Sin stranded us. The grace sought us. That's sometimes just to take just a little quick detour here in the area of doctrine. That sometimes would be what was called prevenient grace. In other words, before I ever even came to him, before I was kneeling at his, at his feet, God sought me. God was working on me. God was, was preparing the way for me. God put people in my life to bring me to salvation. That's prevenient grace. In other words, pre, it comes before. It's that thing that I couldn't have, I, I didn't even know was happening maybe, but God was working in my life. So when sin stranded us, grace sought us. Whereas sin branded us, maybe as a loser, as a failure, destined for hell, grace blesses us. Sin tried to say, you'll never be anything more than this. But grace says, come on in. It brings us the blessing of sins forgiven, salvation through Christ. And then maybe we could go to a third one as well, where sin tortures us. Grace triumphs. The grace of Jesus, the grace of God, abounds, abounds toward us. Notice that word there in verse number 20. Grace did much more abound. Sure, there were plenty of issues in my sin and and in my my failure, but grace abounded. I am am welcomed into the family. I'm, I'm given a place at his table because of grace, because he cared about me. So let's not misunderstand what grace is. Grace, this is sort of a simple definition, I suppose, but grace is God's loving favor shown toward undeserving people. Grace is God's loving favor shown 
toward undeserving people. We can't earn it. We can't do enough good to get there. We can't somehow span the gap, but God did. God did through Christ. And God simply chooses to offer his blessing for our benefit. In the context today, it's, of course, applied to our salvation, but maybe there's some other areas. Obviously, we need forgiveness of sin. Grace is what gives us that. But there are some other areas as well that perhaps we can can focus on. So let's just look at several aspects here about grace this morning. First of all, grace overcomes our guilt. Grace overcomes our guilt. Now, what that kind of points to, where, where does guilt come from? Well, it's our past. It's that past wickedness, those things that we've done that that we didn't deserve forgiveness for. We we should have been cast into hell for them. And yet grace overcomes our guilt. Could I just remind you here this morning, every person, no matter how privileged, no matter where you came from, what side of the tracks, what family name you have, every person either is or was a sinner. That's part of who you are. We, we've already dealt with that. Has Adam passed that on to us? Every person either is currently or they had been before salvation a sinner. That means that every one of us has baggage. Not one of us has done it right. Not one of us has somehow navigated our way through life and never sinned. The only one that ever did that was Jesus. And so because of that, even though we may sometimes feel like nobody's as bad as me, and even Paul himself called him, him, he referred to himself as the chief of sinners. That's part of who we are. And yet, grace can take care of our baggage, can take care of that past wickedness. It can overcome our guilt. I just heard a, a program just this past week where... Um, There's the the question a little bit of feeling guilty and truly being guilty. And yes, we may have both, but could I just tell you every person here this morning has been guilty. And sometimes the devil tries to bring back those feelings of guilt. Now again, make sure you understand the difference here. There's feeling guilty and there's being guilty. And once Jesus has cleansed our our past with his blood, we are no longer guilty because he already took that. He took it upon himself. We may sometimes, the devil tries to make us continually feel guilty. He doesn't want us to, to sense forgiveness. He doesn't want us to feel like somehow God has restored me. And so over and over, he may try to bring those past regrets, the past guilt back into your life. But don't let him make you feel guilty when Christ has declared you forgiven. Grace overcomes our guilt. Where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. Obviously, we would be embarrassed if we tried to take a few moments this morning and call out the different sins we had done. Nobody wants to do I hope, hope nobody wants to do that. We're ashamed of those things. We don't want to even think about those things. It made us feel miserable. It's part of the nature of sin. And yet the devil tries to continue to dredge them up and try to remind us of them. And yet no matter how bad they were, grace abounds more. Praise his name. We can be forgiven of our past. Grace is not bound by by the baggage that we have. Grace is not somehow... Uh, faltering and wringing its hands and wondering, how can, I, how can I get this one out? No, grace multiplied. Uh, that's not the best way to say that, but it can, can uh, in extreme measure, we'll say, it can offer forgiveness. It did much more about, not just barely, uh, just barely made it. That was a close one. No, it says it did much more abound. Grace overcomes our guilt, our bondage, our baggage. Wants to give us forgiveness. Praise His name. Grace also overcomes our giants, secondly. Our giants. Part of that, sometimes it may even go back to our past guilt. And sometimes there are things because of the nature of choices we've made, 
because of things we got involved with, it puts a giant in our path. There are some things we have to struggle with. Maybe there are some things that the enemy continues to bring back our way and tries to say, oh, why don't you go back over here? Why don't you try this? Why don't you go over there? Because of our baggage, because of things that we already put into our minds or experiences that we've already had. And so it puts a giant in our path and the devil tries to attack us. But grace is bigger than that present warfare that we're in. We haven't made it to heaven yet. And sometimes it may seem like there's such a giant in our way. And yet God wants to step in with grace, like David, and with just one stone, the victory comes. He destroys the giant from our path, and we are given victory. Grace overcomes our giants. Again, everybody has their own personal battle. I know we don't like it. We don't even maybe like to admit it. And some might even have the idea or suggest to, to those, uh, you know, in a discussion or whatever, oh, I'm never bothered by those things. No, I'm never tempted. I, I have some real questions about that. The devil's after all, every one of us. If you're not being tempted, it may be just that you, you're not recognizing it anymore. Maybe you've just kind of yielded too often. You don't even recognize it's a temptation. I, I don't know, but we are in a warfare. But we have grace, grace to get us through. It's not just mercy when we fall every time, but God has provided through the blood of Jesus, he has provided grace for victory. We can overcome. We can be a conqueror. Doesn't matter if it's the tongue, if it's drugs, immorality. Maybe it's an evil temper. Might even be laziness. I I don't really know what your giant may be. And there's no need for us to sort of diminish or, or kind of cast dispersions against somebody else's battle. Oh, I, I don't even know why they fight that. No, no, don't, that's, not, that's not our issue. The thing is, whatever you face, whatever the battle may be, there is grace to overcome. Where sin abounded, where Satan even would try to bring, bring sin into our lives, grace much more abounds. And we have the, the opportunity for victory Grace combats our giant, and grace can abound to give us victory over any attack. Praise His name. Well, maybe we ought to just stop. I know I've said praise His name various times, but maybe we ought to just stop and just say, thank you, Jesus. We have grace. You have provided a way. We can have victory. What a wonderful thing. So, grace overcomes our guilt. Grace also overcomes our giants. Maybe I'll mention one other one, too, that grace overcomes the grave. Grace overcomes the grave. We might refer to that as those future wages that had maybe haunted us. Now, I understand there may be some that they, they'd like to maybe just kind of put off any kind of, of accounting for those wages until just, you know, hoping in mercy. But that's not really what I'm talking about. I'm saying that grace can step in and give us eternal life even after sin had its way for a time. Now, that has to be taken care of on this side of eternity. We can't hope that somehow there'll be, you know, some provision made for us over there once we've breathed our last. That's not what the Bible teaches whatsoever. But instead, we can have victory now. And... Some may really struggle. I just, you know, I've lived so many years just doing my own thing. I've, I've failed the Lord so many times. Maybe even I've tried and failed. Other times, maybe I just have, I know he was prompting me. I know he was trying to work on me, but I just, I failed to respond like I should have. So sometimes we have those issues as well. But could I just tell you, there's a verse right here that we need to remember. Let's take a look at it. Verse 21 that as sin hath reigned unto death. What does that reigning talk about? That means it had control over us. It was leading us right to death. But as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness, here are the three words, unto eternal life. Unto eternal life. Grace abounds even when it comes down to the point of death. 
that we can hope in heaven even though we know our past. We know what we had been bound by. We know the giants we had faced. We know the many times that we had maybe resisted the work of God in our hearts. But in those moments, we can just have a reminder, grace wants to take over. Grace wants to step in in your life. Grace wants to give you hope beyond the grave. There are so many people, it seems today, that have just lost hope. They feel like there's no way out. They're just going to go to hell anyway. But where sin abounded, grace does much more abound if you'll let God have his way. Those key words are so important. Unto eternal life. Sin's wage is death. We can't ignore that. But grace provides hope, pardon, confidence, victory, ultimately eternal life. That's what grace provides for us beyond the grave. Again, sometimes people can, can have the idea. I've, it seems like I've dealt with different ones, uh, whether in person or virtually, but dealt with different ones. It just seemed like, oh, I've lived too long like this. I just, I could never truly be saved. I, I can never get right with God. Or others that maybe would feel like, well, look, I've, I've wasted my whole life. I can't come to God now. But that's what grace is for. Grace wants to step in, no matter how bad you feel, no matter how miserable and what a failure you've been. Grace wants to step in and say, here's eternal life. It's God's gift. We can't describe it. We can't understand it. I mean, we could try, but we can't fully understand it or describe it, either one. But it's who God is, and it's what he's provided. And where sin reigned unto death, grace can reign unto eternal life. What a wonderful, wonderful blessing. You don't need to die in your sins. Don't let the devil tell you that, that you've messed up too long, too bad. You can never get right, but come to the Savior today. So could I just maybe close by asking a question? What are those things in your life that maybe have kept you from enjoying God's best? Maybe we could say it another way. What areas do you need grace the most? And thirdly, what are you going to do with God's grace? You see, he's offered it. And as the a bit of a more modern song maybe would say, were it not for grace, I can tell you where I'd be. I'd be going some uh, pointless road to nowhere with my salvation up to me. I know how that would go. It wouldn't be pretty. I'll just kind of uh, end the, the words there. But I'll just tell you, that's the sum, sum of the song. It wouldn't be pretty. I can't get to heaven myself. I can't somehow make my way to God except through grace, the blood of Jesus that's been shed for me. It's been shed for you. And so this morning, His amazing grace abounds bigger than even your biggest problem, the sin, the suffering, the giants. Let it do its work today. Would you let grace have a chance? God wants to transform your life and give you the hope of eternal life. Amen.